So, as Uchi said, you know, by the, when we, we were your age, we really didn't, you know, we were still very innocent. Mm -hmm. um, and in my case, still uh, quite pampered. So when I was 18, um, I was, I think, just entering my undergrad, my first year at university. By 19, my father had won an election in Nigeria to be president, and by 20, he was in jail. So while he was in jail, my mother became active, and in my senior year, two days to my graduation, she was gone down. So my family went through, it was a roller coaster ride. And if it taught me anything, it taught me that um, it's so important to really build your own strength. It's wonderful to have loving and caring parents. For many of us, we're fortunate to have this, but not everyone in this room can even say that they have loving and caring parents. Some of you may have um, parents that are always criticizing you, who don't even see your value, who try to suggest that maybe your brothers are more important than you are. That wasn't my case. In my case, my father was a champion of his daughters as much as he was a champion of his sons. And then he was a champion of sons and daughters outside of his own family. He probably sponsored over a thousand people, thousands, not even over a thousand. I mean, he gave money to universities across Nigeria. He did so much to help tens of thousands of students. So talk less of what he was doing for his own family. But all of a sudden, he wasn't at home to do any of that. He was in jail. And if you're in jail, you can't really do very much to help. So then we had to call on our own, our own, our own ability to take care of ourselves. And in the case of my mom, because my father had uh, multiple wives, in the case of my mom, she um, had seven children, and I was the second of the seven. So when she was killed in 1996, we had, at the time, we had, my youngest brother was seven years old, and the one, the one after him was nine years old, and I was not even 20, and I was already going to be a mother of a seven and a nine-year-old, and I hadn't gotten a job, because we were in America, I was, just graduating from school, there was no job, we couldn't have any money. So well, whereas my father had been very rich, all of a sudden we were pretty much very poor. And we had to <coughs> learn how to take care of each other. And it was not an easy journey. Life often is like that, that the journey is not easy. But you know that saying that what doesn't break you makes you stronger. What doesn't break you makes you stronger. And what I want to say is, we were able to take care of each other. We were able to build um, the family. I didn't have to prostitute myself to do. And without prostituting myself, I got a job. And I was able to look after my siblings and myself. I was able to get us a house to live in. I was also able to become one of the key people in Nigeria's pro-democracy movement because we, we had a movement to end military rule in Nigeria. So I became an advocate for that. Mm -hmm. I became an ad advocate for that because my mom had done that. So I want to say to you that whatever journey you get on in life, and you can get on any journey, you could do this modeling and decide that this is really what you want to pursue and you want to be like Iman, one of the biggest models in the world. Or you could say um, you want to be in the back end of the fashion industry, you want to um, maybe be like um, Katerina, designing the clothes. You could even be even further back in the industry, not even involved in designing the clothes, but in in, and be involved in textile design. You, you could do anything. But whatever you do, if you think that it can go, it's, it's going to go like this, you're dreaming. And I know we're supposed to dare to dream, but I think the goal is to dare to dream. Even if it goes like this, you can still pursue mm -hmm. your dream. Mm -hmm. And we have to be, prepa be prepared to pursue our dream no matter how, where it goes. So when we began to um, fight for democracy in Nigeria, um, 
I was speaking at universities. There's a film that's been done in, in the US now that has been shown around the world. Um, and showing me speaking in universities, speaking to all kinds of groups, you know, and in the beginning, I couldn't, I was so nervous. Who was going to listen to me? But I was able, I was lucky because I found people who cared about Nigeria, who cared about human rights, who cared about democracy, and they gave me a platform and they helped me. And I remember, you know, today um, Katrina was saying this other lady was late. You know how Nigerians, when something is supposed to take 40 minutes, Nigerians will give themselves 40 minutes. So I used to have a flight to go to a part of the US and speak to a group, and I would arrive at the airport late because maybe there was unexpectedly some traffic. The plane would have gone because in the US, not so much like our local flights in Nigeria, if the flight is at 10, that flight is at 10. Sometimes it could be late, but usually 10 is 10, and they're bored by 9.30. So sometimes I would get to the airport and I'm a little bit late and it's too late. That taught me a lot. It taught me about being ready. So I don't, I stopped working from, if it's gonna take me 40 minutes, I give myself 40 minutes. If it's gonna take me 40 minutes, now I give myself 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. So today I arrived at, um, I got downstairs, Uchi had said be here for nine o'clock. And I got here at 8.20 and I was actually embarrassed. I thought, <laughs> what am I doing here at 8.20 a.m., you know? Uchi hadn't even arrived. I got to the, to the reception downstairs and they were like, mm, is that for the nine o'clock meeting? I said, I'm sorry, I'm early. <laughs> I was early, but I actually think it's good training also for you. Because when you're pursuing things you want, you have to, you have to do more than the other people do. Because you're the one that is presenting yourself to them. So you have to show up early. If you show up early, it doesn't hurt anything. Absolutely. You can just sit down and prepare your thoughts, or you could read. And then when the person comes, they'll see you already waiting. It already signals to them that this is a serious person. You know, but we in Nigeria, we, we're optimistic. We always hope for the best. Well, when you're daring to pursue your dream, I want you to dare to plan for the worst mm -hmm. and prepare for that. To plan for the, the worst. The worst. You know, not, not because the worst is going to happen, no, but because you are female, because you're a woman, mm -hmm. and because women are especially vulnerable. So, you know, in Nigeria now, you, all of you, each one of you is a very beautiful young woman. As you all stood up, I could see why you were models. You're very slim, you're tall, you're graceful. In the country that we live in, we have some men, and it's not just here in Nigeria, it's global, who will look at you and see a toy. Mm -hmm. You are not a toy. You're a human being. You have your own thoughts. You have your own plans. You have your own ambitions. Some of them will not see that. They'll just see this beautiful woman and they'll think, I want that woman on my arm. I want her making me look good so that when I go out, people can look at her and see that I'm a successful guy because such a beautiful girl is standing beside me. Such a beautiful girl is my girlfriend. And maybe there's nothing wrong with that, but many men forget that they're supposed to respect your point of view while you're looking good on their arm. And that's very dangerous for you. But imagine that you are also financially vulnerable. You don't have money of your own. So when the man starts showing that he doesn't respect your point of view, you start thinking, well, my mom is not very well. I have to stay with him. I have to because it's helping me take care of my mom. Or this dream that I have is helping me finance this dream, so I have to stay with him. I don't want that for you. I actually want the harder road for you. You know, many times I, I go, because I, I have an organization, so I go and meet powerful men, because most of the p powerful people in the world are men. Most of the wealthiest people in the world are men. So when I want to raise funds for the different things I work on, I go and see men. And sometimes they look at me and they think, oh, it would be good to help her, and maybe she can be my girlfriend. Now, I don't know if you notice that I have my rings on my finger. This is my, the engagement ring my husband gave me, and this is my wedding ring. And I'm kind of, I was raised in a Muslim household. My father had four wives, but it was a very conservative household. Mm -hmm. And that conservative household meant that for me, in our home, we, 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 th we think, is this my husband? Then this is the only man that knows me in that intimate way. So when I go and meet this man, and they start uh, sending fillers to check if it's possible, 
quickly I let them know that it's not even honorable. Mm -hmm. It's not honorable for them, it's not honorable for me. And I don't know what your religious ideas are. I really don't care so much about religion. My father is from, um, from a Muslim family, but he was educated by Christian missionaries. They gave scholarships for his education, which is why my family were building mosques as well as churches, financing Christians and Muslims. We don't really pay attention. My father used to say that his religion is love. And love doesn't know any bar barriers. And you know, what I'm saying to you is simply this. When men hit on me, I have to remind them what we all know. What do we all know? Every child that is born, what do you know for a fact? You know you're going to die. So the physical body that we're all accepting that you have, that we're saying is so beautiful, is only temporary. The only thing that is permanent, that is infinite in time and is eternal, is the spirit. And that spirit records itself and reports itself to the creator, only one being, from whom nothing can be hidden. So I have to remind them that, look, you may have all the money in the world. It's going to stay with you. It's going to stay with your body when you leave this earth. You will go to another place. It's not my job to compromise your family relationship having an affair with you. And it's not your job to seek to compromise my spirit to seek to have an affair with me. It's not going to happen. And once I am clear, what can they do? Unless I want to try and rape you, there's nothing happening. And it's better for them because right away, they stop thinking of you as a toy. Mm -hmm. They may not like you because they want you to do something with them that you have refused to do, but they'll respect you. And I want you to have that respect. Now, when they get over their disappointment, they may also look and say, what is it that this young woman wanted to, um, to um, talk to me about, that actually this idea is very interesting. Let's look at it again. Maybe I should invest in this idea. Some guys, most men don't have this problem. Most young men that are your peers won't have this problem. They just go to a guy and sell their idea, and nobody's going to be trying to hit on them. But when you're an attractive young woman, you will find that some of the challenges you face are unique to the fact that you are female and that you are attractive in a world where men often don't know their limits. Mm -hmm. But you have to try to make sure that you define those limits for them. Because otherwise, what they'll do is they'll turn you into a toy. And you will wake up one day and look in the mirror and wonder at what you see. And you, you won't recognize yourself. Mm -hmm. You could have the diamonds. You could have all the jewelry. And there will be no respect for yourself. Then what do you have? I think the Christians say, what does it gain me to gain the whole world and lose my soul?